Hello, everyone. <clears throat> this is Successful People. And in Successful People, we talk about successful people. And if you showed up here, you're successful. My definition of success is anybody who is taking one step towards their dream. That's my definition. Because you'll never achieve total success. You'll always be striving for something. So when do you draw the line? When you call your successful, when you call yourself successful or not? Well, like I said, as long as you're walking towards your dream, you are successful. Reach over your left shoulder, pat yourself on the back, and say to yourself, I'm successful. Isn't that isn't that true? You know, if you're if you're growing, if you're learning, if you're if you're wanting to be better, no matter what challenges you find yourself in, you're successful. So let's talk about let's talk, let's talk about that today. Today is May seventh. Um, last week we talked about the success cycle. I'm going to cover a, a little bit, uh, a little deeper on that today. The the success cycle, if you remember, at the very top of the the this, the uh, picture you see there is, you got to know what you want. And then you have to, number two, you have to decide to go get it. Most people will tell, tell me what they want, but they won't make a decision. They'll, they'll wish. A wish is not a decision. A wish is nothing, right? But when you decide, you say, I want to go get that, then your brain starts to look for ways in which you could achieve that. Then you got to declare it. You've got to say, not only do I say that to myself, but I'm willing to risk looking like a fool to talk to everybody else about it. And then I'm going to set a deadline. I'm going to decide I'm going to do it by this day. And I'm going to make sure that deadline has rewards and consequences. It doesn't have a reward, a reward or a consequence that it's not a deadline. Look at the word deadline, dead line the line beyond which you are dead. Therefore, there needs to be a consequence. And most people, they, they, they set goals, they set, you know, things that they think are deadlines, but if it doesn't have a consequence where there's pain involved somehow, or a reward, either good things or bad things got to happen on that day, and then you make the decision to go for it with the deadline, and you go, you do it, you make it happen, and then when the, when the deadline approaches and is, is reached, did you achieve what you said you would do? If you don't, then you do it over. You keep doing it because if you said you're going to do it, okay, so you said you're going to lose 20 pounds and you only lost 18? Does that mean you're going to go out and uh, buy a bunch of haagen and, and eat yourself into oblivion because you missed your, your deadline? No, it's, it's do over until you say you get to the 20, right? Or you double down. So um, this is just kind of a, a way in which I think about, about success. Um, success. We're going to highlight every once in a while uh, people who are not living. Next week, Brian Tracy, who is a living legend, will be with us. And I'm going to challenge all of you to be there next week, May the 14th will be a living legend. This is uh, Beethoven, who is a, a, a legend no longer with us. But although he is no longer with us, his music survives. Um, you have probably heard some of his music before. Let's, let's see if you remember this. that one for so so uh 
Could you, I don't, I've never played music before on a Zoom call. Could, could you hear that? You could hear that? Oh, my gosh. Yes. In, uh, yes, in, yes, was fabulous. Hear it. Wow, yes. wow. Then I give you goosebumps? It was written yes. in 1808. Uh, Beethoven was 38 years old. A couple years before that, he started to lose his hearing. Before his hearing was completely gone, uh, six years later, he was almost totally deaf. Before his hearing was completely gone, he was able to finish Beethoven's fifth, one of the most famous piece of music. Four notes, do you notice those four notes? Bum, 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 bum. And the entire symphony is four notes. It's just, it's fascinating. Bum, 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 bum. Bum, 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 bum. And it's what? It's the pentatonic scale. Yeah. Bum, 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 Beethoven, he's one of the greats. He's talked about successful person. This is successful people. That's where we talk about successful, successful people. And who are successful? If you're successful, raise your hand. Because you're here. Everybody. Ali, raise that hand. Get that hand up there. Wesley, Angie, Gordon. If you're taking one step toward what you want, you are successful. Now, you can leave a legacy, like Beethoven left a legacy, a legacy that still um, makes us sing, you know? Uh, how many years has that been now? 200 years, 214 years, something like that? <laughs> So, this was written by somebody who uh, had some challenges. Beethoven's confrontation with fate and destiny is a good example of our ongoing battle with these forces beyond our control. We are now are living through a coronavirus is circumstances beyond our control. Well, we can control a little bit of it by social distancing. But generally speaking, as it sweeps over the world, it's beyond our control. And physically and emotionally, as, uh, hold on just one second, I want to mute everybody in the background there, a little noise in the background, try to keep it quiet. Um, he, can you see, can you still see that, uh, the note at the top? Can you see it, Laurel, you can? So physically and emotionally abused as a boy, his father was an alcoholic and beat the crap out of him. He was extremely introverted as a child and became increasingly isolated from the world as a young man, frustrated by his efforts to earn a living as a musician. Then at age 28, just as his music was starting to attract attention, he began to lose his hearing. His first reaction was, was anger followed by a deep depression. Remember, this was 28 when he started to lose his hearing. The fifth, Beethoven fifth, was, was released to the world when he was 38. So he was losing his hearing. He still was able to produce some good stuff. But th this is a, a letter he wrote to his brothers. This letter was written right when he would, when he had pretty much lost his hearing. This was written six or eight years later after Beethoven V. And this letter was never released to the public. No one ever saw this while he was alive. They actually found his, this letter written to his brothers who became his heirs. And his brothers were able to discover this letter that he wrote to them, but never sent to them. And uh, what did he say in this letter? 
He said, what a humiliation when one stood beside me and heard a flute in the distance and I heard nothing. Or someone heard the shepherd singing and again, I heard nothing. Such incidents brought me to the verge of despair, but little more and I would have put an end to my life. He com considered suicide. Remember, this is still after he produced one of the greatest pieces of music ever to have been produced. And now he's, he's deaf. And what is he going to do with the rest of his life? He says, only art it was that withheld me from co committing suicide. Ah, uh, it seemed impossible to leave the world until I had produced all that I felt called upon me to produce. And so I endured this wretched existence, truly wretched. I don't know if you've ever heard any, any great person ever say such really discouraging words. And yet, this is one of the great ones. They all do, they all suffer through uh, challenges. That's life. Life is a disaster for most people. Um, one of the reasons that I, I actually noticed or I remembered about Beethoven's story was because you know, last Friday, my hearing started to, to decline. And um, I'm, I was a little nervous about it. I have a doctor's appointment tomorrow. Uh, but I'm thinking about, goodness, what, what would I do if, if I lost all of my hearing? That would be, that wouldn't be very fun. And so I got a lot of ringing in my head and it's, that's not fun at this point. It's not, it's not disastrous, it's not terrible, but I'm just gonna read what one of the greatest hearers said about his hearing, right? Well, what, what did he produce after he wrote this letter was, uh, is it, this is what, this is what, the, continuing the story, the most beautiful years of my life, he said, must pass without accomplishing the promise of my talent and powers, he wrote to his close friend, Carl Friedrich Amenda. But six months later, Beethoven had decided to take fate by the throat. It shall not wholly overcome me. It might've taken him six months, but he finally made a decision. He took fate by the throat. He, he said, I won't let it take me by the throat. Even though he was profoundly deaf, by the age of 45, he, did, he died 12 years after that. But he was profoundly deaf at 45. He died at 56, 12 years before his death. It was during this period that he composed his greatest music, including the Missa Solemnis and the Ninth Symphony, six string quartets, and his final piano sonatas. So, when, when you have a challenge to your life, you have to make the decision, is fate gonna win or are you gonna win? And in this case, Beethoven decided fate was not going to win. And he was going to profoundly deaf produce Beethoven's Ninth, ninth which was, which was um, uh, performed um, two years before his death. He was there at the performance. Um, he couldn't hear a thing. He was actually, his back was to the audience and he was watching the performers, uh, the uh, musicians perform. He was watching the choir behind the, the, uh, the musicians, huge choir. First time a choir had ever been added to a symphony huge choir and when the the when the um, symphonies was over and the performers stopped you know playing their 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 instruments he could not hear the applause it was just watching he was just watching the audience was behind him and somebody had to come up to him and tap him on the shoulder to tell him to turn around and look at the audience that was going wild about this performance. Uh, applauding, standing ovations, screaming, hollering. He could not hear a single sound. All he could see was their joy at hearing that piece of music. 
he, thereafter, he uh, started to decline rapidly. He suffered for the next three years of his life, and then he died. But he left a legacy, which is an interesting word, right? This is the beginning of Beethoven's Ninth. So this is what he wrote when he was totally deaf. chorus is at the very end, the finale, is a chorus you've heard many times. Uh, and he has, I don't know, I don't know how many choral, choral members there were, 100 plus probably, but this is a chorus at the very end that you've heard before. Um, very famous uh, German ode that Germans know very well, but this is, this is Beethoven's rendition of it. And this, uh, this is it right here. that music was written with no sound. The only thing he could do was hear it inside his mind. He had to hear what the violin was playing. He had to hear the drums. He had to hear the cello. He had to hear dozens of instruments inside his mind with no outside sound whatsoever. Uh, when he was composing with his piano, he cut the legs off his piano so it could be down closer to the floor so he could feel the vibrations of the notes in the piano, but he couldn't hear as he was playing the piano. He had to, he had to, he had to create the bass of the chorus, the tenor, the soprano, the alto, all of, the, all of the various different parts of that choir, he had to write the notes from just what was happening inside his head. I'm obviously a genius, um, way beyond uh, my capacity to think of even, I can't even play chopsticks on the piano, let alone, you know, imagine that inside my mind. Uh, but this is the same guy who, who wrote the letter that I read you earlier, where he, he said, one more little thing, one more challenge, and he would have ended his life. It would have been ending without leaving us with the, the Ninth Symphony from Beethoven. Um, when things happen, like the coronavirus, we, we get to decide how we react. Sometimes it takes several weeks before we kind of settle in and we finally go, I'm not going to let fate take me by the throat. I'm going to <laughs> and make it 
make ha some happen. So for, for all of us here on this call, um, what, what do you want to create <laughs> during this time? You know, what, what do you want to make happen? What, uh, what legacy do you want to leave? Well, at the, at the very least, you've got to leave some, some, some written words or maybe some spoken words. Um, in this case, what we're doing right here, this is a recorded version. Where this is happening live and it's being recorded. And so it, there's, a, there's an archive. There'll be an archive. Maybe 100 years from now, someone will be roaming through the archive and they'll go, what the heck is this? And, and somebody might, at least we're recording something here. We're, re we're creating some kind of a legacy. And with Zoom, which is great. The, the recording is permanently archived there for us. It's amazing technology. Um, question I want to ask you is, what, what do you want to create? I, I, I love quotes. Um, and when I, when I see a great quote where a lot of wisdom is summarized into one little sentence or two, uh, I, I love to collect quotes. Many of you are probably quote collectors also. Have, have you written a quote? What's your quote that you have said or thought? Have you ever written down one of your quotes? Um, I'm going to give you an opportunity here to make it permanent. So I'm going to have you write one of your quotes. Now, while you're thinking about it, you don't have to write yet. I actually want you to take a blank piece of paper and on that blank piece of paper, these are not some quote you heard from somebody else. I want you to take your wisdom of your, you've learned in your lifetime and think about it. If I could summarize one lesson or one aha that I've had in my life, this is you talking to yourself, what would it be? Um, how would I phrase the words so that uh, it would be a good, a good, uh, a good summary of a, one of the lessons that I have learned in my life. This is you're saying to yourself. Now, when you go to, um, when, I, let me take you to where I store my quotes. And uh, those of you who are, uh, see, I think you can see this. This is Instagram. So uh, when you go to Instagram forward slash traits of the greats, this is where I like, when I find a great, a quote that I really like, then I post them here. So um, I just started doing this just a few months ago. So don't have a lot of followers, but hey, you know, follow, follow this if you like quotes. And I've got a, a, a gal, Tins is her name. She's from the Philippines. And so she finds some pictures for me and I send the quotes to her and she, she and I figure it out and uh, we decide whether we like it or not. And so this is one of my favorites, the, the Michelangelo quote right here in the middle. I think that's beautiful. She's got the, can you see that? Laurel, can you see, is that too small to see? Can you see it? If people knew, this is Michelangelo talking with a picture of the Sistine Chapel in the, back, in the background. If people knew how hard I worked to get my mastery it wouldn't seem so wonderful after all. And if you've ever stood in the Sistine Chapel, if you've ever just admired, and you realize that all of that was created by one guy laying on his back, you know, painting this in one place. Of course, he had a team of people to help him, but he designed it, he created it. Un Believable, really. That's another one of my favorites. Um, even as you read this, the universe is plotting to make you utterly happy, healthy, and successful, and there isn't a thing you can do about it. <laughs> so says Steve. Behrman, is it? So I love quotes. This is, the, this is the, a bigger picture of one I just read to you. And uh, Tins, my Filipino artist, tracked down that image. 
And uh, that just gives me goosebumps, you know. Um, let's see, uh, let's see, let's try another one. About, uh, you can only have as much as you believe, says my uh, co-author and, and three of my books, uh, Mark Richard Hansen. Gotta believe it or you can't have it, right? What's the opposite of abundance? Oh, this is one of my quotes. Uh, what's the, it's a little long. What's the ab opposite of abundance? It's not scarcity, it's greed. Greed is the belief that there is not enough for everyone. So you'd better grab yours now. What's the opposite of love? It's not hate, it's fear. Fear is the belief that someone or something can hurt you. So, um, I'm going to ask you to create your quote. I want to put your quote in my quote book. Uh, here is my, one of my favorite guys, Winston Churchill. I love this quote. Success is going from failure to failure without losing enthusiasm. Love that quote. And I've read all of his biography and his autobiographies. I, I hate this guy really resonates with me. He was huge failure in the, in the First World War, catastrophic failure. They fired him in the First World War because of his mis mistakes that he made, or he was blamed for being, having made the, the disaster in Gallipoli. And, and he came back in the Second World War. And um, so anyway, I'll, a lot of different quotes. I'm gonna ask you to create a quote, you know? Um, how could you summarize a lesson you've learned into one sentence or two or three short, short paragraph? How could, you, how could you say it in a unique way, a fun way, a different way? Um, how can you, um, when you think about life, you go back over life, you go, what did I learn, by the way? What did I learn from being here? You've had some successes, you've had some failures, you've had some challenges, like Beethoven. He left a legacy. Uh, at the very least, you, you can leave a legacy. Of what, what are the words that you write? Now, you don't have to write an entire book. Uh, right now, I'm working with a group of people, and we're going to have, by, by July, our books will be done. We got, we're working with a bunch of dozens of people that are working on together. We want to put a book down together. But the, at the very least, I'm going to challenge you to write down one quote, one quote that you, you think is worthy of, being, of making permanent. That, where you can say, I said that. I really think I, I think I said that. Instead of, instead of gathering other people's quotes like I do, and I gather them, I love them. In fact, whenever I wanna be inspired, sometimes I'll go through my quote file and I have a quote file with a thousand quotes in it or, or more. Let me show what it looks like. And whenever I, I find a great quote that I like, uh, for example, let's see, this is my quote file. You probably have a quote file. Do you have a quote, quote, quote file? This is my quote file. This uh, was, okay, I, I wrote down one of the quotes. <laughs> I was editing an article, which was going to come out tomorrow, as a matter of fact, online. And there was, a, there was a line in my own article that I wrote. I thought, now that's a good quote. I like that quote. The faster you can laugh at life, the faster you can learn from it. Um, then well, then I, I go through, you know, look at this. Jim Rohn, what's Jim Rohn's quote? Uh, uh, Steve Schwartz, Martine Wallace, she's from Australia. A lot of these are from real people, live people that I know. Steve Schwartz, for instance, outwork your excuses is what he says. And uh, Martine Wallace from Australia says, show up as if you are already there. 
great quote. She, she said that in a speech when I was in Australia speaking to a, a, a nutritional company called Rx. And she said that from her speech. I thought, that's a great quote. I wrote it down and then I put it into my quote file. Um, you can skip an ingredient and still get, can you, can you skip an ingredient and still get the same cake? So this is one of, one of my quotes, meaning, hey, you gotta have all, you gotta, you gotta have all the ingredients in there or you don't, you don't get a good result, right? Um, this is one from the, on the mother F, mother effing. <laughs> so it's not something I would say out loud, but you know, it's an interesting quote. Time and again, studies have shown that outrageous content produces the most clicks. It's why Facebook pushes negative comments to the top of their threads. Did you know that? And anyway, so I want to put your quote in my quote file. Um, Lisa Sasevich, I, I did a, a Traits of the Greats interview with her. She got a brand new book uh, called uh, Made for More uh, that just released this last month. And uh, Lisa Sasevich, love her, she's awesome. She says, don't die with your book still on your hard drive. <laughs> Isn't that a great quote? Don't die with your book still on your hard drive. And, and I, guess, I guess the question I would ask all of you is, one of these days we're all going to die, so what are you going to leave on your hard drive? So make sure that it doesn't get thrown out with your hard drive, right? Ali Brown says, money loves speed. Three words. Great quote, you know? Uh, here's a couple of my own. Uh, don't put yourself down, put yourself up. Um, Neil, uh, anyway, I, see, it just goes on and on and on and on. Every time I find a quote that I like, this is where I put it. And one of these days I'll have a book, it'll come out. Oh, I love this one, this quote. Oh, this one gives me goosebumps every time I read it. Before, thinking about my own children, before you were conceived, I wanted you. Before you were born, I loved you. Before you were here an hour, I would give my life for you. This is the miracle of love. Ooh. You know why that's so poignant to me? is because my mother, on the day I was born, May 20th, she gave her life for me. She died the day I was born. The day I came into this life, she left it. I never saw her. But I know she loved me. And I'm looking forward to, you know, I had a cousin who wrote me a, an email. We were doing a little family research and she wrote me and she said, I'm talking about my mother. She was a, a cousin about my age. And she said, and they, Amy was such a, such a wonderful woman. She said, I can hardly wait to meet her. <laughs> I wrote her back. Well, give yourself another 30 or 40 years. You'll meet her one of these days, but don't hardly wait for that, okay? Anyway, so what I'm going to ask you to share with me is your quote. As you think about all the life lessons you've learned, what, how would you say it? Maybe it's not a full book, like, you know, the books that I've read with 100,000 words. Every one of my books has 80, 100,000 words in them. But I want, give me 10 or 20 or 30. We show, I showed you a quote that had three words in it. Uh, there's a lot of quotes that 40, 50 words in it, but give me a quote, less than 50 words, 
that would summarize one of the thousands of lessons that you have learned in this life and that you want your family to know that you learned that lesson. You're, the people you know around you, hey, they may not like the quote, you know, and they might think it's maybe not perfect or well-written, you know, but it's your quote. It's what you learned. And it, you put it in the words that made something to you. They meant it. Those words meant something to you. And who knows, it may never be famous and it might be not spread around the world where people will put it in their quote books all around throughout history. Maybe it's just something you share with a family member and you say, you know, it's not the per most perfect way of saying it, but this is kind of like what it meant to me, right? So right now, um, you can always email me with your quote, by the way and uh, email me at author at robertallen.com. You can email a quote to me, so I'll put it in my quote book. If I don't like it, I won't put it in my quote book, by the way. It's got, it's got to resonate with me. I won't just put anything in there, so forgive me if it doesn't make it, but um, I certainly want to read it. I want to thank you and appreciate it, but right now, if you have a quote that you would like to uh, memorialize in this conversation right now today put your quote uh, with your name attached to it in the chat right now if you have a quote if you don't that's okay you got time to think about it you can always e email it to me later all right so I'm gonna give you a couple of minutes yeah, everybody can write your quote here if you like to. And don't want you to send me a quote that you, that from somebody else. No, it's got to be you. Put your name on it. It's your name. You know, the most beautiful sounding words in, in any language, it's the words of your name. Your name. So I want to see... Okay, good. Tom. Urbanic? Urbanic? Is that how you say that? Very good. Happiness is a journey. Here we go. Gordon, we all have a gift. Life is for sharing that gift. Nice, Gordon. Very nice. Very good. Margaret, take charge of your health. Take charge of your life. Thank you, Mar Marga Margaret. Marguerite. Marguerite. Uh-huh, my quote, Peggy Grant, always be simmering something great in the soup pot of your mind. Whoa, now ah, we're talking here. Good. Tim and Beverly, let me brighter grow until the dusk instilling hope. Well, I'm, I, since this, people are adding, I'm losing the quotes. Love makes the world go round. Prince, that's probably somebody else's quote. Um, but hey, contribute. But remember, when you type the quote in, I want to see your name type. Type your name attached to it. Lawrence, oh, your, oh, your Norman name is at the beginning. Good. John, whatever you believe to be really true is really true for you. Thank you, John. You have one life. Pay attention. I read a quote by Lisa Sasevich last night in her book, and it was... Uh, When you pay for something, you pay attention. So she says, you need, you need to charge people for your expertise. Because when people pay, they pay attention. So that was kind of going along with uh, adversity as a gift, said Rashid. Learn to use it. Thank you. Good. Keep, keep coming. Everybody, this is our quote book for today. Yeah, okay, good, good, good. Keep them coming. Very good. Doug, I'll call you back in about 10. Thanks. All right, Kenneth Kelly, Kenny Miles states, every day above ground is your, is your day, still make it a great day. Okay, good. 
share your fare. Oh, interesting. Ooh. Yeah. 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 Tim Thorndike. Okay, everybody. This is your day to memorialize this quote. I had a friend of mine who every day creates his own quote and posts it on um, LinkedIn every day. His own quote <laughs> posted on his LinkedIn group. Uh, that's a lot for me. I, I don't think I could do it every day. But the reason it works for him is because he programs his mind. And he goes, what's my quote for today? And he lets it ponder in his head all day long. And then as he's going through all his activities for the day, the brain just pops a quote into his mind. And he goes, hmm, that's interesting. See, your brain is the most powerful computer in, uh, alive, you know, your brain right here. So when you program it with the right kind of question, the, the brain will give you the answer. So I haven't programmed my brain with that, with that prompt, like give me, a, give me a quote every day. But he has, Dennis is his name, Dennis has programmed a quote every day. So maybe this would be something you might think about. Because it forces you to see life through the eyes of a teacher not through the eyes of a student. Let's just think about that perspective. When a student, hungry to learn, looks up at the master, oh, master, you know, tell me, tell me what I can learn, how I can use, uh, that's from a student's mind. And of course, I look to my masters the same way. But when you look through the eyes of a teacher, it requires you to use all of your brain not just the student mind, which is usually a student mind is empty. There's not a lot of information in there because they're always asking the, the teacher to fill it. But when you're looking at life through the mind of the teacher mind, then your entire brain gets accessed. And when you're trying to teach, you, you pull from everything you've ever experienced. And therefore, you see the world in a different way. You see lessons you never have imagined before because they were hidden to you because you're kind of looking through a, through a student's, student's mind. If you're looking through a teacher's mind, what can I teach today? Um, how can I teach that in a different way? How can I share that with a group of people so that they would get that lesson? Hmm. Just causes you to think your brain in a totally different way. So... When you're creating a quote, you're coming from the teacher's brain. What did I learn today? What could I share today? How could I say those words in a shorter uh, way of saying it? Um, how could I take a long quote and make it shorter? When I wrote um, this book right here, this is called The Challenge. Send me Danny unemployment line. Let me select someone who's broke out of work and courage. And in two days' time, I'll teach them the secrets of wealth. In 90 days, they'll be back on their feet with 5,000 cash in the bank. Never set foot on unemployment line again. That was the subtitle of this book. This is why this book did not sell very well. But this book is the story of me taking people off an unemployment line and then teaching them mindset, skills, strategies, people skills. And when I wrote this book, I wrote, I had 500 pages of manuscript. It took me I bought an, uh, an apartment, a big, huge um, office space in Provo, Utah. It was the uh, old campus of Brigham Young University, where the original campus was, where my father went to the university at BYU in 1920s. That campus was abandoned and sold by BYU, and it had been sold to a whole bunch of different people. And I bought it. And it was 100,000 square feet of vacant space on University Avenue in downtown Provo, Utah. And I bought that space. It was a, a big expense. And I was not able to develop it like I had dreamed to develop it. But at least I owned the university where my dad went to university. I owned the building. And while we were developing it, it was not heated, it was cold, and there was 100,000 square feet of all kinds of buildings. And I went every morning 
to a cold space in the middle of a hundred thousand feet of feet of square of of, uh, of uh, hundred thousand square feet of vacant space, and I wrote this book. It was a story of me going to the unemployment line, and it took me a couple of years to write it. Two years later, I sent them the manuscript, five hundred or uh, five hundred pages. My editor looked at it and he said we can't publish this this is way too big this would be a you know a huge book you know he sent my manuscript back to me and he said cut this in half i just spent two years of my life writing this thing you know i go in the office every day we have a, a space heater in this you know big office space of just me and a space heater and uh I called a friend of mine and I said, I got, I got to cut this down to a size that's reasonable. And he says, well, I'm a screenwriter and I, I want to tell you how a screenwriter writes. They write differently. And so he, we would take my manuscript. We, he was sat right next to me and for a month, this is all we did for a month. He would take one sentence of my manuscript. We would read it and he would say, could you say that shorter? in a shorter way. And so we would cut a few words out of it. And he said, does that, does that sound better? Is that, is that a little cleaner, a little crisper? Yeah, it is. So he said, okay, see if we can say that a little shorter. Can you say that sentence, that thought, that idea in a little shorter way? And we would cut it down to seven words, you know? And he says, is that crisper? Does that seem to kind of flow a little faster? He said, well, truthfully, it is, it's, it's, it's better, yeah. He said, let's see if we can cut it down a little bit more. We would cut it down to one word. He says, does that say all you needed to say? And I go, unbelievably, it does. And he said, that's a screenwriter's job, to say lots of words in a few, in a few little, little snippets. And so we took, that's why this book is half the size, because we, went through and I learned how to say things in a shorter way. It's not, I, I haven't fixed that with, with regards to my verbal speaking, because it usually takes me about a half an hour to get up to speed. But anyway, what I'm trying to say is your quote, I'm going to ask you to, as you rethink it, could I say that a little crisper? Could I knock a word or two out there? Like, you know, that one quote I read you earlier from, was it Brene Brown or somebody else? You know, Money loves speed. Whoa, is that, you could say that in a paragraph and you could say it in three words, you know? Could you say your quote in just a few less words? Um, and I showed you an example of some of my quotes and they were, they were longer. They needed to be edited and they still do. Um, what, what could you write? So now, Oh, here's Ken McCready. Our worst nightmare is someone else's dream. Interesting. Yeah, that's poetry, says, uh, says uh, Gordon. Poetry. Oh, poetry. The few poems that really, that really speak to you. Yeah, I read one the other day that I learned in high school. In my English class, there was only one thing I learned from my English class, 11th grade, one, one thing I learned. I hated the class, it was my worst class. Speaking of a writer, English was my worst class. And she said, this is a poem I want all of you to learn. And she made us learn it. This was when I was 17, so that was 50 years ago, 54 years ago. She says, Ozymandias, do you remember that one? I met a traveler from an ancient land who said, to vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Beside them on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and curled lip and sneer of cold command tell that the sculptor well those passions read, stamped on these lifeless things. The the, the the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal, these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. 
Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, the lone and level sands stretch far away. When, I, when you hear that poem, it's like wealth. Wealth is nothing. The only wealth that really counts for anything is the wealth you take with you. It's your heart. It's your soul. It's what you build. It's your character. It's your integrity. It's, it's who you are. That's wealth. And Ozymandias' wealth, did he take his wealth with him? Well, whatever he took with him, wherever he went, um, that's all he got to take. You can't take it with you. Oh, yes, you can. The things that really count, that's what you take. And in this case, um, that poem just says it all for me. And uh, anyway, so um, ramble too long. We, we, need to, we need to end this today. Gordon, you reminded me about poetry and how just a few words organized in the right way are really profound. Any final quotes you want to put in there as I wrap it up? It'll be the final chat. Yeah, cash loses value. Creativity never will. Oh, I didn't say that, but I'll take credit for it. I like it. Very, very good. Okay, very good. All right. Okay, any ahas or thoughts you'd like to leave with me before we end today? What uh, author at robertallen.com is my email address. Okay, any thought? I want you to share your aha with me today. What did you learn today? What, do, what, did you, what stood out for you today from what we talked about, what you learned, uh, what I shared, or maybe what I said triggered something that you said to yourself? That's an aha. What did you aha today? Yeah, tell me. I want to I wanna read it. Thank you. Keep it crisp. Okay, thank you. Super class. Li live, ha oh, <laughs> good. live hanging out with you. That's great. That's right, Angie. Keep creating. Good. Think as a teacher. Mm, yeah. Words are like diamonds that you polish it. The, the more you polish it, the more it shines. Yeah, nice. See, I, those words were not said today, but that's the aha you got. Yeah. Quotes may make me think of legacy. Yeah. So you can create a quote. Yeah. The beauty of Beethoven's art. Live by my own quotes, my duns. Nice, John. There you go. Uh, I don't need physical ears to create good music. Nice. Nice. Uh, Nikki, have the courage to make a declaration to the world. New, nice. Peggy, anybody who is taking one step toward their dream is successful, as long as you're walking towards your dream. That's essentially my thought. Uh, I haven't made it into a quote yet. Uh, I love these calls. Oh, I'm glad. I'm glad you enjoy them. Invite people, you know, invite people. Let's just have some fun. Um, yeah, super class. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Well, I have another real estate challenge in the future. Uh, Ryan, no, I will never do another real estate challenge. I have other kinds of challenges. And, you know, I've, I have writing book challenges, things like that. Uh, yeah, leave behind a legacy, yeah. Hi, uh, I am Fury, good. The success cycle, you like that. Thank you very much. Okay, everyone, love you. Make it a good day. Leave some footprints. Leave some footprints so that people can see you were here. Yeah. God bless. I love you. Bye-bye.